December 23rd, it is a Wednesday, and this is episode number seven of The Grail, the podcast that celebrates the small business man or woman, the artist, the maker, the craftsman. Each week, I try to uh, turn you on to something new to, uh, to inspire you to maybe go out and do something you've always wanted to do. My guest today, wow, I really, really can relate with this guy. He was a uh, rock and roller, played bass in the band The Dance Hall Crashers. You guys remember them? Out of uh, Berkeley, California. Signed a major deal on 510 Records, 510 Records, back in the day. Did massive touring, uh, sold records. Had a good career, had a good run there. And then my guest, Mikey Weiss, said, nah, I want to try something else. Moved to New York, and uh, his whole life changed. And you're going to hear the story here. He owns a place called Mikey's Hookup. And it is in Brooklyn and now in Silver Lake in the uh, Los Angeles East Hollywood area. And I got to tell you, man, it was great to talk to this guy, especially, especially during this COVID times and these, uh, the different landscape of podcasting, meaning most podcasts these days because of COVID are done over Zoom. And all of a sudden, uh, overnight, we were all scrambling on how to get the best audio What do we do? We had guests face-to-face for years. Now we've got to do it on these new platforms, and it sounds bad. Uh, what What do we need? What do we need? What cables? What microphones? What, um, what preamps? All this kind of shit. What kind of recorders? Mikey's Hookup is, uh, definitely a place for that. They've been exploding, uh, in Los Angeles during the COVID and his Brooklyn shop's been open 20 years. So this guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to audio recording and when it comes to podcasting and also projector TVs and Apple products. They repair stuff. Just a great, great human and perfect example of a type of shop you need that you hope never goes away. You know, mom and pop, it might cost a little more, but you're paying for their knowledge. And people go, I'll just go on Amazon and get that. And then they send it. You go, this is the wrong cable. Then you send it back. No one to talk to. Then you go to YouTube. Some guy tells you, you should get this cable. I know. That's what I did. And uh, then I got sent to Mikey's hookup and wow, dudes there know. They're like, look, you need this, you need this and this, and this is how your podcast is going to sound great during the COVID era. Maybe you're a DJ. Maybe you want to spin online. Maybe you're a home recording, a rock and roller. These guys, they just know it. And his story, Mikey Weiss's story is unreal. Just a great, great success story. Something that you hope never goes away. These types of stories. And the only way that'll happen is if you stick to buying in the neighborhood. Go see that guy face to face. Brick and mortar. Small business. That is what it is about. There's some stuff you can buy online. Who gives a fuck where you get your, uh, you know, your your apple cider vinegar and your Coca-Cola? Yeah, whatever. But I'm talking about the people, the record stores, the electronic stores, the, the clothing stores, the eyewear store, all these types of shops. You go in and you go, wow, is this any good? And the guy goes, ah, that's okay, but this is better. This is more for you. Oh, you know, you can't afford that or whatever, you know? Those stores where you get insulted. 
but you learn. You know those ones. I remember I was young, I go in and ask the guy, hey man, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, uh, I'm looking for Slayer Fool. <laughs> and the guy's like, Slayer Fool? Because these guys were like, that's Slayer Fool. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> anyway, great guest. And uh, it, was, it was really, really fun to talk to this man. This podcast is brought to you by CBD Lion. You guys are all out there maybe with a little anxiety. Maybe you have uh, some body aches, some joint pains. You got to get some CBD. CBDLion.com is where you want to go. Use the code DEAN for your full-on 20% off anytime, all the time on all your products. CBD Lion is a 100% clean third-party tested cbd this is not that 7-eleven truck stop shit i'm seeing that stuff out there i'm like what is that this is the real deal and i've been using it for years not years uh over a year now so you know i notice when i'm not using it it helps me with my sleep it helps me with joint ache helps me with neck aches cbdline.com Use the code DEAN at checkout and get a deal. Tell your friends they got pet tinctures too. You got that cuckoo pet? Get it. Get that. Put it in your dog's food. Watch them stop barking and just chill out and watch TV with you. CBDLion.com and my other amazing sponsor, Banker Guitars. Banker Guitars, the boutique guitar kings. Fine handcrafted guitars. You got to get yourself a Banker Guitar like Marcus King has or Scott Holiday. They're playing Banker Guitars. Mastodon's rocking them. They got the Karina Vs. They have the Karina Explorers. They got parts and accessories, all that kind of stuff. Hit up bankerguitar.com tell them i sent you and uh come on be a rock and roller in 2021 do not be shy and uh looking forward to talking to uh my man matt pretty soon on the show it's gonna be good i don't know i think we're gonna do it next week i'm pretty sure the banker team meet them Matt and his wife, Sarah, bankerguitar.com. All right, let's get into it. Thank you for uh, tuning into the podcast. Brand new episode here, and uh, I'm loving that the, uh, the feedback I'm getting. I'm loving the feedback, my friends. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on iTunes and, and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. A lot of great episodes coming up. Have a great Christmas and uh, keep the candles lit. Here he is, Mikey Weiss. My name's Mikey Weiss. Uh, living now in LA, but I was living in Brooklyn for the past 20 years. Um, owned, uh, I have a store in New York and a store now here called Mikey's Hookup. It's like electronic store, musician supplies, pretty much a store for people that like to record music on their computer. So that's what it is. That's what the store is, is a, uh, for everybody that's home recording, is it Pro Tools people mostly? No, it's, it's anything multimedia, really. It's video editors to Pro Tools users, Logic, obviously. But even uh, art galleries, people that want to hook up 20 old CRT TVs to one, what is it, like any game system. But... Uh, yeah, anything that involves cables, adapters, and audio. Right. Yeah. That's why I came to you, because in this era of coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, all podca- podcast landscapes changed immediately. Mm-hmm. It became a Zoom platform. Some people are using Squadcast. Some are using Blue Jeans. Some are using... Uh, uh, what's the old school one? Um, what was that old one? It was like video calling, but, uh, oh, uh, yeah. What is it? Starts with an S, right? Skype. Skype. (laughs) 
I, yeah. I, it's so long ago. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. It's, it's not even that long ago. <laughs> right. I was, but in electronic first I was going to say WhatsApp, but no. But in electronic right. world, it's like uh, 100 years old. Yeah. It's pretty much like Friendster. I was talking to somebody and they go, yeah, you got to try Skype. I go, that's still around? <laughs> right. I've been in this complete obsession for the last month because I'm coming off a podcast that I feel the audio quality is pretty damn good. Uh, I've been doing it nine years, 500 something episodes, Mm -hmm. and I've really figured out how to get great sounding podcasts because the, the key to a podcast, the number one thing I think is the audio sound. If it sounds like shit, People, the average ear, they don't understand this sounds like shit. They're just like, I don't like this podcast. They don't know why, and they turn it off. Right. And I became obsessed with it, and everybody, you know, there was this standard kind of of this NPR sound, and I thought that was a little too kind of a, all right, they don't do it. It's a little weird. It's, it doesn't feel real to me. And so I've kind of figured out what works for me that I like audio-wise. Also, I'm kind of cursed like you as an ex-musician. I'm cursed with knowing what sounds pretty good. Yeah, no, it's all about the full sound. If it's too thin, I usually just want to turn it off. Even if I'm listening to a band and if it's not a full sound and it's too thin, it just, I don't know, it throws me off. Right. And... uh any good podcast it has a full sound and it has a lot to do with obviously the mic that you might be using you don't need fancy effects and compressors really no really you just need the energy and a decent mic you don't have to spend a lot of money and a quiet room i've been doing this podcast nine years on this machine right here h4n old trusty the huh old trusty old trusty yep it, I, I don't even know how the fuck these guys are still in business because this thing does not, I, I, I'm, I don't want to curse myself, but it has been so reliable. I it mean, is. the buttons haven't popped off. Look at this. The sides are great. The only thing ever that everybody complains is, is the battery compartment. But I figured out how to master that a long time ago. And you could still plug it into the wall if you really wanted to. I plug it into the wall only mm-hmm. because what a lot of people don't know, and I found out real early on when I was interviewing Tech Nine, one of the greatest podcasts and the only one I ever lost, was if you don't have batteries in that thing and somebody walks by and accidentally unplugs this, that is gone. Right. Because it's a digital file and it needs a front stamp and it needs a back stamp. Exactly, yeah. So I keep batteries in it at all times and you can just unplug this right now while we're recording and it seamlessly uh, goes to the battery power. Right. No, it's like having a laptop. Yeah. You know, keep yep. it charged. If you trip on the cord, you're still doing your session and you're right. fine. So my point was we're into this new age of podcasting. And it, it, it did one thing. It leveled the playing field because now I never wanted to do phone interviews. To me, the thrill of podcasting was face-to-face, right. finding out who this person was and watching it unravel as I interview them without even doing research. You know, like I don't like to do a lot of research because most of the guests on, I've been a fan of all my life. I've already got the questions I want to know. Right. So... The level playing field, meaning everybody is kind of in the same sound platform now because of the, uh, the things we're using, Zoom, uh, Squadcast, or whatever. So I immediately was like, I need to sound better. I talked to Mark, Mark Marin, good friend of mine, and he was using his uh, SM7 into his equipment still. So I said, I got to get like that. Because when it first started, I was just going Zoom uh, computer mic and that person's computer mic and Zoom (laughs) and no headphones. And you start learning, you're getting this because it's getting feedback from the speaker into the mic. You're getting a almost an out of phase sound. Mm -hmm. 
So I was like, okay, this doesn't work. So I'll wear headphones. Okay, it's getting better, but the microphone sounds like shit. So I went to see you guys. No, it's the best way to start off because if you started off with an SM7, you really wouldn't know why you needed an SM7, why you needed a cloud lifter to boost right. you know, the pre's. So starting off recording straight to you know, the shitty little mic in the laptop is the best way. You got to start off small, work your way up because you got to figure out what you need and what you don't need. We see so many people walking in, you know, with their mom and their black Amex going, I want the best. Yeah. And I say, if we sell you the best stuff right now, you're going to be so afraid to use it. You're never going to use it. Right. And it's going to be in the next garage sale. And so you got to start off super easy. Start off with a USB mic into the computer and start having fun. Once you start having fun, then you start realizing what you really need. That's the whole trick. Absolutely. Just for anything. If you're an artist, you're a musician, you don't, you don't, your first amp's not going to be that, that high watt. Yeah. 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 And, and the, you know, 59 Les Paul. And <laughs> right. The, yeah. I get it. Now, my experience from uh, coming into your store over the last uh, week, which by the way, my doctor recommended uh, me to you. Did you get some work done from him or something? I did not. No, I'm actually uh, friends with him. My wife, um, actually is best friends with his wife. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. They grew up together in Israel. Yeah. I love this man. He's, oh, he's uh, incredible. Yeah. yeah. He saved my, <laughs> saved my neck. Right. You know I mean? Not the, it's gotta be the worst surgery of, uh, uh, I mean, you know, the yeah. procedure is like, I hope I don't have to use them. Oh, it's so gnarly, <laughs> man. But it, it's not that gnarly, but if you stay awake, like I did, it's pretty, uh, if you don't like needles like me, yeah, yeah. I'm covered in up. tattoos, but that's a different needle. <laughs> right. You don't even see those needles. I wouldn't know. Never had one. Yeah. Okay. So I go into your shop. Now, I've done about five different things that have seemed not to work. There's a cord sitting over there that was $100. That plugged into... That long skinny cable? Yeah, that dumb thing. And that plugged into a, a kind of a pigtail that's up there. Oh, I saw that pigtail. That's yeah. just wrong yeah. all around. So headphones <laughs> and, um, and uh, microphone. And that was supposed to uh, work, I saw on YouTube. There's so much crap that people actually pick up on YouTube and in forums that it might plug in. Right. You might actually get some kind of sound. Right. But it's just terrible. Oh, yeah. And, and you waste so much money, so much time. When That's what my store is actually all about. You don't have to go to the forum. You don't have to call tech support. We have people that work there that have been through everything. They've set up so many different situations, and we're happy to tell you what to buy, what not to buy, and why it doesn't work. Like, for instance... Um, during the whole shutdown, very popular thing, which still kind of, I get confused by why it was so popular, DJing into your Instagram account. Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. <laughs> Live. Yeah. So for some reason, people found it really entertaining to watch a DJ spin records or just spin their music from their digital device on Instagram. I tried doing that last night. It's so, so funny you said that because you know what now? After 30 seconds of playing the music... Instagram started giving me warnings. Exactly. You're past 30 seconds. You can't. I was like, what? I've never seen this before. So do you think during the lockdown? During the lockdown, they realized there were so many people playing music that obviously didn't have the rights to just play music through Instagram. That's crazy. I mean, if you played original music that is not found on the Internet. Well, of course. Then you're yeah. fine. But no, millions of people were doing that. And uh, they finally put a stop to it. But what I was going to say was so many people were doing it wrong. Right. The number one thing people were being a were asking for at our shop was called the iRig. The iRig was originally designed to plug into the phone so you could plug your guitar into it. And it's a quarter inch mono connection. And so it's 30 bucks and for some reason it got all over the internet. That's what you need to plug in your record player. Or right into lightning? It goes that into the headphone jack, so you'll still need the lightning to headphone adapter. Gotcha. But what they were doing, they were plugging a stereo connection 
adapting it with like a headphone jack, a headphone adapter into this quarter inch plug that was supposed to be for guitar. And so you're just getting one side of the music you're playing. So if you're DJing the Beatles, you're just going to be hearing the drums. You're not going to be hearing Paul. Wow. And just old school mono mix. Just terrible. But not right up the middle. No, just one side of the song. Oh, yeah. So like if you had an old school stereo and one speaker came unplugged. Exactly. Right. And, uh, and they were spending, they were buying so many extra adapters to still make it sound like shit. And all they needed was Apple actually made a lightning to USB adapter since the beginning of the iPhone and a simple USB to RCA adapter. So in the end, it was so much cheaper and it sounded so much better. It was a pure line level signal stereo sound into the iPhone. And we were actually teaching customers about this because they were coming in because their friend, their DJ friend, told them to buy all the wrong stuff. Right, right. That, well, that's what happens. Yeah. So I'm on YouTube. So then after that, I started doing these things called Zoom Fest on Saturday nights for my Patreon followers. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you, if you were a part of my Patreon, you could join me in a Zoom Saturday night. I still do it right now. And we shared records and, uh, and anything that we love, denim, cars, watches, anything. It's just a Zoom Fest. Uh, there was a guy on there that had a incredible gamer headset. Okay. Had a headset. And, and so while we're on Zoom, he sounded fucking great. Like a broadcast guy. <laughs> so I buy that. It takes a month to get here because his headsets are sold out because of COVID. Finally gets here. I put it on. Sounds great. Download the software. They even had broadcast mode, all the FM radio <laughs> mode. Uh, hit that, sounded great, recorded, sounded like shit recorded, distorted, you know, the mic's right here, you're getting, so sent that back immediately, and then I started going crazy, so then I went to see you finally, and I can't even believe how easy it was, and I'm still not 100% there, I'm still tweaking, but it's a million times better, and what I got was a focus right. Uh, Scarlet Solo Box mm -hmm. that you plug your mic into that and your headphones into that and then you run a USB into your computer and boom, That's that it. fucking easy mm -hmm. with this cloud lifter if you're using uh, SM7s. I didn't need it with the 58, but I did use the cloud with a 58 last night just to check it. What happened? And it just, it warmed, uh, you, you could turn it down without needing to go all the way up for power. Mm -hmm. I tried to run the cloud without the cloud since that had phantom power on it mm -hmm. and but for the SM7 and you would have to turn it all the all way to the way 10. Yeah. No good. No, you get so much more control with the cloud lifter. Yeah. Now we're there. Now we are there. For a, I would say, a, for me, about a 70% kick-ass audio for, for Zoom. We're talking about a compressed piece of shit audio file that they're basically giving you. So I would say it's 100% kick-ass for what I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, I've been bouncing around through other companies. There's one called Squadcast that Marin turned me on to that supposed to be better because they they say they take the audio from the front instead of downloading it at the end and squishing it they take it from the, i don't know i listen to it back to back it's not bad but you get into people uh going yeah i can't seem to load it up it's it's super easy i, it, I think the thing is clunky Whatever is the most reliable, just stick to it. Right. Because then you're going to actually get the work done. Right. Stop messing around, experimenting with, you know, what someone might have told you might be better. Whatever's working for you is working. Right. It's sounding great. What I wish is every week, whoever the guest is, overnight that set up to them. Right. Overnight at FedEx, say, plug this in, and then we both have microphones. Because then you're on. But you're dealing with some people that don't understand how to hook shit up or anything. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. There's the artist and then there's the people behind the artist. Right. I learned that a long time ago when I opened up the store. And especially when I actually hire people yeah. to work at the store. There's people that know Pro Tools and Logic inside out. 
they could run it with their eyes closed and they know exactly what they're doing. But if you told them what cable goes to what connector to what interface, they have no clue. They just know how to work the, uh, the just stuff. the program. And I need to hire people that have actually hooked things up yeah. and know how to troubleshoot why it's not working. Why is it distorting? Why don't I get enough level? Those are the people that are working at the store to help your situation. Exactly. Right. I think the, the 2020, 21, 22, whatever model of podcasting or recording or whatever is you better know how to do it all yourself. <laughs> right. Because I used to rely on people and you can't believe how fast they disappear after a couple months when they don't have the work ethic and the uh, drive that you have. Right. At first, they're like, this is great. I'm part of a podcast, right on. And then they go like, yeah, I'm going to watch TV. No, you have to do it yourself because at a drop of a hat, they could be gone. Right. They're gone. Right. Yeah. So we got into why you're here. And now I want to talk about how you started your store because you were in a band called Dance Hall Crashers. Right. From the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were uh, around during that awesome Gilman Street era. I'm from the Bay Area also. Oh, nice. I played every club on the planet but Gilman Street because <laughs> I, was I wasn't part of the ska, punk, Tim Rancid world mm -hmm. of uh, you know all of that scene, Green Day and all that. I love all those bands, but I was never part of Rancid or Green Day. It was, I was, by the time they were hitting, I was definitely... Uh, Wilco, Americana, uh, that kind of thing, that all country world. Mm. But did you grow up in the Bay Area? I grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up actually in Danville. Well, Danville. Yeah. Well, I played a theater there. That the theater oh, the dance hall. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So you're I close the vets to hall. <laughs> yeah, you're close to Walnut Creek and exactly. all that. Yeah. Danville's kind of a rich area. Well, I mean, my family moved there in 1978. From where? From Oakland. Wow. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was born in Oakland. Then we moved to Danville. So I was. So you are a, a Bay Area guy like me. Absolutely. Rad. And then during high school, I got into a band with my friends, as you would. As you're, if you're a musician, you start a little band in high school. And I wanted to be the manager. And I wanted to get the shows because none of the other members knew how to call a club, book a show. I had no clue. They just wanted to play the music. Yeah. And I wanted to make sure we had a show. And I became the manager, and I would make the flyers, put them all over the place. And we were, I think, junior in high school, and we were getting some serious gigs. Yeah. And we were playing, we played with the Melvins, we played with Primus. Where, like the Stone, the Omni, and all that? Berkeley Square, the Omni, yeah. yeah the, I used the, to book the Omni and oh, the Stone. Oh, did you really? Yeah, that was my oh, gig. Omni was a pile of shit. Of course, it was. The pay to play. Oh, uh, yeah. But we made a killing at the Omni. Yeah. Because I figured out there's, well, I don't know. You know that you have to sign a contract. They, they give the bands a bunch of tickets. Right. If they catch you selling tickets in the parking lot, yeah, yeah. in the contract it says they could take all your equipment. So we were afraid of that. We didn't want that to happen. So we were in the parking lot, and there are the bouncers checking out, making sure people aren't selling the tickets. Yeah. So we made a little barbecue, yeah. making hot dogs, hamburgers, get some beers, and we give it to the bouncers. They'd just look the other way. Yeah. And we'd sell all the tickets in the parking lot. We were on stage with just money coming out of our, yeah. our jeans, just so stoked. Well, that's what I was saying, man. <laughs> People complain about pay to play, but if you knew how to work it, man. You got to work it, If yeah. you were opening for Primus... <laughs> You had Primus tickets. <laughs> right. I always tell people that. Like, if you're open for the Melvins, you, now you have Melvins tickets. But obviously back then... I get it. There's 50 people in the club. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, we played some great shows. And right after high school... Were you listening to KVH, K, uh, KVHS? I wasn't, no. Uh, so, yeah, after high school, most of the... Yeah, all the band members went off to college. I wasn't a college kid. I still wanted to continue playing music. So I started a crazy psychedelic instrumental band called Rug. The Rug? Just Rug. Rug. Just R-U-G. Wow. And we were playing shows around the Bay Area. And one day, my brother comes home from Chico with this cassette tape of Sublime. A He's killer. Like, I was just at this party in Chico, and they were playing this tape. It was awesome. So I took it. And he's like, you got to check it out. 
So I took it. Yeah, he just stole the tape from the party. <laughs> Chica so, rocked, man. Yeah. Leather hips, all that air up there. So I'm listening to him. This stuff is great. I open up uh, reading, you know, the inside. And it says, for booking, call this number. So it says, call this guy Miguel for booking. So I call Miguel. I'm like, hey, my band Rug from the Bay Area would love to play with you guys. Have you ever played the Bay Area? He's like, we've only played Southern California. We're just, we would love to play the Bay Area. He's like, book a show, we'll be there. So I book a show at this diviest, shittiest bar called The Real Rock. Oh, The Real Rock. You remember The Real Rock? Absolutely. They had strippers between every band. The Real Rock, it was just this dump down this <laughs> old, like, weird, like, industrial era. And The Real Rock was the club that tried to battle us all the time outbid and they were the ones i told this story a couple weeks ago with my partner jimmy arsenal who uh was my partner at booking at the time they outbid us on alice in chains and mookie <laughs> blaylock at the time which was pearl jam mm-hmm. like like i think that the, the show was like twenty five hundred dollars all in and they bid like five grand we go oh you got it and the day that band got there they they got shut down because they had a liquor license and stuff. So they were closed, and okay. then we had them play at the Omni at the last <laughs> minute and called like 50 of our friends. But I remember the real rock. Such a crappy place. But they booked us, and they, yeah. would always, they loved booking us because we would bring in people. And so we booked the, booked the show, put out some flyers, and I had no idea if anyone's going to know of Sublime. And we get to the club, and the place starts filling up, like packed. But with the crowd that you just wouldn't expect to be at the Real Rock, there were like people with cowboy hats, there were punk rockers, there were hippies. It was just every group. And it just looked like bad news because something bad was going to happen. Yeah. Because you don't see this crowd in one place. There's All no different one. people, yeah. Yeah. And we play, we, we had Sub, Sublime uh, play after us to headline. And we play, everything was fine. And the second they get on, they start forming. And, Within, I think, the second song, just a crazy brawl breaks out in the middle of the floor. Just fists and things flying, glasses, everything. And the owner runs up on stage with a shotgun. Whoa. Cocks it. Yeah. He's like, everyone out of the fucking club right now. Whoa. So everyone runs out of the club because there's like a dude with a shotgun. Right. And next thing you know, there's maybe five or six uh, Oakland PD. Yeah surrounding the parking lot so the whole crowd is in the parking lot the owner with the shotgun in front of his door and the cops behind their cars with their guns out and we're all in middle between shotgun and the cops and it was the scariest night ever wow and so the cops finally roll in on the owner he puts the shotgun down they cuff the owner drive away with them and the entire crowd in the parking lot just starts cheering just starts screaming with laughter. We all go back in the club. Sublime continues. And we had the most amazing night. And everyone just got along right after that. Now, was, did Sublime have a draw? Or just people just happened to be there that night? Like, no, let's just they go had out. a draw. They, Sublime had no idea if they were going to get a crowd there or not. But it was but just a run of different people, huh? I guess their cassette tape was just copied and passed around. Right. And Old school, like yeah, Metallica. Exactly. And... Uh, well, when I eventually got into dancehall crashes, we played with Sublime a whole bunch, and we would just talk about that night all the time, because it was incredibly freaky. We didn't know if we were going to get shot, if yeah. people were going to get arrested. We didn't know what was going to go on. But uh, yeah, it was their first Bay Area performance. Yeah, playing with them was, you never knew what you were going to get. It was kind of, kind of a sad situation. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Absolutely. I sometimes... Mean- Bradley Heroin would, is gnarly, man. No, yeah, Bradley would be the most amazing performer, or he would come up on stage, throw his guitar on the ground, and just sit there. Yeah. yeah. So you play music. You're in dance hall crashers, and you play music for a long time, mm-hmm. a lot like me. And then you just tap out. Well, we toured a lot, right? Like in the mid '90s, we were pretty much like the first major ska signing. Um, I remember after, 510 Records. Yeah, 510 Records. Yeah, yeah. who was the um, A&R guy, kind of guy there? Well, the two main guys were Elliot Kahn. Elliot Kahn, yeah, yeah. yeah of course, the yeah. famous manager. Exactly. Right. And Jeff I, Salzman. Oh, and Jeff Salzman. But yeah, yeah these yeah. guys were Bay Area bigwigs. Yeah, yeah they were the managers of Green Day at the right, time. Right, and they decided to start their own label. Exactly, and we were the first signing. Wow. 
And uh, at the time, we were trying to get signed, and we were doing showcases. And uh, the, only, the only label that was really interested for, was Metal Blade at the time. Oh, Brian Slago, good friend of mine. And I'm like, Metal Blade and a Well, they're band. great, though. I mean, yeah. look, they signed that... Uh, What's that band, uh, the three dudes, and uh, they had the huge fucking uh, hit later on, but they were like a punk band, and then they kind of changed into kind of like soccer mom rock. Uh, <laughs> they're huge, three dudes. Still, they're still playing? Yeah, fuck, it'll come to me. God, <laughs> <laughs> Slagle right now is probably going like, fuck, come on, you know? Oh, they had that song, Iris. I don't remember. It was a huge hit, Iris. Hold on. Let's check it out. <laughs> I'm just, it's going to kill me if I don't know. And, and, and I'm a music guy. Let's see. Who sang the song Iris? Iris is by the Goo Goo, Goo, Goo Dolls. Dolls. Oh, the Goo Goo Dolls, of course. He right. signed the Goo Goo Dolls. Oh, okay. So that, you know, it was heavy. It was a metal label. But by the time the Goo Goo Dolls kind of hit, then he starts looking at all different types of music. Right, of course, so he's strictly metal now again. But, but we did a... We were doing, we were trying to do showcases, trying to get signed, and we did a showcase in at House of Blues right when they opened up in L.A. This was like '94, I think. Right. And we pull up, and the the manager of the House of Blues comes out to the parking lot as we were loading out, and it was just going to be a headlining show, and maybe some opener no one's ever heard of, and we had a decent draw back then. We had a good crowd in LA probably bringing in maybe 500 people yeah and so we were expecting a decent show there even though that place holds 1500 of course it's huge and so he comes out he's like I have some news for you guys um let us know if it's cool but Prince wants to uh perform tonight do you mind if he goes on after you (laughs) would you mind (laughs) yeah I, I think that would be great. Yeah. yeah. yeah, I, yeah. Bring them on. Yeah. yeah. yeah See yeah. what happens. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we played <laughs> L.A. with Prince immediately in the, in the bio. So within a few hours, everybody in L.A., like all the celebs know about the show. Right. And the parking lot is packed. The, the place gets packed with everybody in L.A. We get on stage and we play our fucking asses off to just backs. No one gives a rat's ass about us. Well, just backs. Yeah. Because yeah. our crowd couldn't even get in. Right, right. The guest right. list was so huge. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's supposed to be a showcase. That was supposed to be a showcase. Right. And the labels were there. They got in. They were on the guest list. Yeah. But they were so excited to see Prince. They didn't want to see us. No, yeah, not at all. So Prince comes out for three hours just playing nothing but blues covers oh i saw that run he did the dna dna lounge did the same thing oh really yeah you're just kind of like really no hot thing no right. dorothy parker no <laughs> beautiful ones it was unbelievable yeah and matter of fact one one time you know like he did the old you ever feel like you got gypped he did the old sex pistols thing <laughs> played like two songs and left you know i've seen prince so many times oh, okay. at secret gigs and shit but yeah. yeah the blues stuff he's going through that yeah and uh so we were depressed, like, yeah, and Metal Blade contacted us after that show going, hey, we really like you guys. Yeah. We're like, I don't think that's going to be our scene. So we do this show in the Sproul Plaza at UC Berkeley. You know Sproul Plaza? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was an outdoor event, and it was just a free show just for the college kids. And it was freezing that day. It was maybe, like, I don't know, 50 degrees. And we played like shit. We really did. And it wasn't much of a crowd because no one wanted to hang out because it was so cold. And that night is when Elliot Kahn and Jeff Salzman called our management and said, we saw you. We want to sign you guys. Wow. <laughs> like during our, our shittiest show outside yeah. in front of no one. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we got signed to the majors and, and went to Fantasy Studios. Oh, look, rest in peace. What yeah. a studio. It was huh? incredible. Wow. Yeah, while we were recording. Who produced it? Um, that was, uh, what's his face? It did... Uh, Oh, no, Stoker produced that record. That's right. Um, Stoker was the drummer of uh, Dexy Midnight Runners. Oh, okay. So he produced it. And you guys are full-on ska band, if people haven't heard it. Yeah, it's ska yeah. with a mix of some punk. Kind, kind of, of like that um, No Doubt was going on. All right. that. We have two girl lead singers and right. harmonizing throughout the songs. Of course. But early on, it was Tim Armstrong. The very beginning, it was Tim Armstrong, Matt Freeman, 
and a bunch of just other punk rock musicians. It's crazy because it's a totally different band, same name. <laughs> By the time different. you guys get a deal, it's it's two female singers. <laughs> it's ska. Yeah. These guys are long gone. It's yeah. it's so weird. It's like going to Seven Eleven. And then it's like a totally, like, if they sold clothes for a while. And then, you know. It's, but yeah, we, I mean, we would still perform songs that, like, Tim wrote a couple of them on the first record. Uh, but while we were recording at Fantasy, um, Rancid was right next door in the, in the studio right next to us recording Let's Go. And uh, he comes over and he goes, I got a song for your album if you guys want to record it. So we check it out and we put it on our record. Um, just to like bring it back, bring Tim back into the band somehow, yeah. you know, which is really cool. Yeah, it was it was a really good experience. Yeah, you're touring for years. I get it. It becomes yeah. a burnout. Mm-hmm. You've been gone. Maybe you got a girlfriend or family. You never see them so anymore. You're eventually, the band. half the band started getting married, having kids. Right. You, you could tour with kids, but it's a drag. Nah. And so we decided to just hang it up. Yeah. And around, I think 2004 was our last show was uh, Salt Lake City Olympics with Fishbone. Yeah. Flew out there, played that last show, and that was it. And then you moved to New York? And then right after that, I get home, back to Berkeley, and my girlfriend, who was living in New York at the time, said, you're not doing anything. You don't know what the hell you're going to do with your life. Why don't you just come to New York and just hang out, and we'll figure some stuff out. And what year is this? This is 2000. So this is... Uh, I, I just like to put the time into this because mm-hmm. what a lot of people don't understand is there's two neighborhoods that are known for hipster. <laughs> In 2002, I moved to Silver Lake. Okay. Right behind Spaceland. That was kind of a ground zero of the first time I started hearing the word hipster. I was like, hipster, you know? And it's the strokes. It's the yeah, yeah, yeahs. It's Kings of Leon. They're all coming through Spaceland. This neighborhood becomes fucking fire, you know? Then pre the TV show Girls, which what Girls is about, becomes Williamsburg, becomes the next spot that becomes a full-blown hipster neighborhood. So do you move to Williamsburg first? I went straight to Williamsburg. Right. And what was Williamsburg like in 2000? It was a really ugly, smelly, dirty place filled with artists that that's the only place they could afford in New York City. Right. Well, they could afford even further out. They but could. Like Bushwick and stuff. It gets but this really was dangerous. Clo- yeah, this was the closest to the city also. Exactly. One stop. One stop to the East Village. Really convenient. And you could go a couple more stops at your Union Square. You could go anywhere in Manhattan. My girlfriend was a modern dancer. And still to this day, I tell realtors, agents, if you want to know the next up-and-coming spot in a city, follow the modern dancers. Modern dancers are the poorest of all, like, the dancers. Right. Right. Um, Because it's it's, it's all about the love of dancing. They know they're not going to make money. Right. And they have to live in a safe spot, convenient, but cheap. Right. And they find the spots. And there was such a big group of modern dancers. Are they dancing on Broadway in the backgrounds and no, shit? Or no, no, they they're, they're doing you know the art, the art dances. I got you. Yeah, like outdoor dancing at Washington Square and shit like that. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know what I mean. It's a mix of like a, an artsy ballet. Right. Wow. So I'm in Williamsburg. Have no idea what I'm going to do with with my life. I don't have a college degree, and I'm working at a video store. And I realized there's... VHS video? or VHS. They rentals? just started getting the DVDs. Yeah, exactly. Wow, okay. Was it a mom and pop? Mom or? and pop shop called Real Life Video okay. on Bedford Avenue. And, and what is rent at the time in New York, at, at, in Williamsburg? I was, I was... Me and my girlfriend were paying uh, 300 bucks. For a full one-bedroom studio? What? For a one-bedroom. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And we were on, uh, on the Graham Avenue stop. Okay, That's yeah. Two stops away from Bedford. And I get this idea. There's all these musicians, and there's all these artists, and I'm a musician that loves to record music. And there's nothing around the neighborhood to buy a cable, not an adapter, not a blank CD. 
And most people just go to the generic guitar center. Exactly. Which would be in the city. Right. And you go all the way into the city and, and you know, you're going to get a kid. Maybe they know. Maybe they don't know. But there's no fucking... I know what you mean. You, you're like, you can't just walk in and go, dude, I mean, I'm running this into my Pro Tools, but I, I can't get it to power up here. And they go, Ugh. Right. But back then, I just needed the the eighth inch to RCA cable or the headphone adapter or the quarter inch guitar cable or a mic cable, the basic stuff, the necessities. You know, I didn't need interfaces. I don't think there were interfaces back then. Nope. <laughs> and so I went to Radio Shack and I went to Circuit City and I would buy all these little accessories, the cheap accessories, the $2 ones. Yeah. Especially the ones that didn't have a brand name. Yeah. And I'd take it out of the packaging and I put it on a blanket on Bedford Avenue. And I would just sit there and wait. And people would walk by and be like, shit, that's a headphone adapter. How much is it? I'm like, oh, it's four bucks. You know, I bought it for 50 cents. Yeah. And they're like, I need it. Just they, right I, on the street. Right on the street. In front of your apartment or something? No, or no on by Bedford. Bedford. Oh, Bedford yeah, I got Avenue. you. Yeah. Bedford and uh, North Fifth. Yeah, right. I get it. There wasn't a single street vendor in all of Bedford Avenue. I came from Berkeley. Where it was like illegal not to be a street vendor. Yeah, tel Telegraph Avenue is exactly. complete, you know, flea market. <laughs> right. I worked at Amoeba on oh. Telegraph for a few years, so I know what street vending is all about. And people were buying the stuff. I would come home making whatever, 50 bucks that day, and I was stoked. And whatever I didn't sell, I would go back to the stores and return it because they had like a two-week return policy. And I'd keep on rebuying the things that people were actually purchasing. Yeah. And... One day I'm wheeling my little cart back to this back home and I bump into this Hasidic guy in front of this little mini mall. Yeah. And this mini mall had a record store, had a cafe, had a yoga spot. It was like a little mall, but everyone was indie. I just took a chance. You would call it, I don't know what you will, but I just said, by any chance, do you own this building? And it was just a Hasidic guy standing in front of a right, building. Yeah. And he goes, I actually do own this building. And I'm like, what would it take for me to sell my stuff in your store, just like a little kiosk. And he goes, come on inside. And he, we walk inside, and he had these two computers at the back of this little mall. And you, you're supposed to put money in this machine, and it gives you a few minutes to get computer. on the internet. Oh, yeah, I know that. I remember those. Yeah. yeah. And he's I've like, seen them in Europe. Right. And he's like, they never work right. They always crash, and no one uses these things. And he's like, I know I can make money on them if people knew how to use them, or they would just be reliable. And he goes, you maintain these machines and make them work consistently, and I'll let you have a little corner in the back of this mall and wow. for free. Yeah. And he goes, let's try it out. I'm like, deal. So I built a little kiosk, started carrying like 50 little products, and I would maintain his machines so well that there would be a line of people wanting to check their AOL. Right. Oh, yeah. Ew, well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, do you got like a flyer outside? Oh, this internet I flyered, and cords. I was flying all over Williamsburg. Yeah. So much that the police would actually come back into the mall like, and give me tickets. Oh, because shit. Because I would put them all over the subway. Yeah. I was, it was true advertising. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guerrilla marketing back then. And so he was making so much money on these two machines, he put in three more machines. And... I was maintaining those so well, I convinced him, I, a store became available in the yeah, mall. Yeah. I go, why don't we take over an entire store, you put like 10 machines in, and I get the one half of the store, and you get the other half of the store. He goes, fine. So a year goes by, I still haven't paid a dime in rent. Wow. And so I have no overhead. Yeah. And so I'm actually making money and putting it back in the business. Are you calling it Mikey's Hookup? And yeah, I've, I've already called it Mikey's Hookup. And yeah, my, my inventory just keeps on growing and growing and more musicians and more artists are finding out about it. And then one day I finally said, I think it's time I get my own store and we cut ties and we shook hands and it was an incredible partnership. Yeah. And he made a killing. Yeah. And, Cause it was an all cash business for him. You don't put credit cards in. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was walking away with just so oh much cash. Oh my God. And, uh, yeah, I got my own store. In that mini mall? In the mini mall, yeah. Gotcha. So he's your landlord now. Now he became my landlord. Right. And uh, yeah, still to this day, we're friends. 
And yeah. is the shop still in the same place? No, I eventually outgrew the mini mall. Right. And on North 6th Street, this giant store that was like four times the size of what I was normally used to uh, came available. And there was nothing on that store except a bar called Sweetwater. I don't know if you remember Sweetwater. I don't. It was the true most punk bar I've ever been to in my life. Really? Yeah. Like straight up, you walk in and there's bottles flying. Oh, yeah. And so you just got to duck and just find your corner. And there was always Black Sabbath playing. There was always some just perfect right perfect just music an for the ultimate neighborhood bar yeah like you'd find in hate street exactly you know like the fucking the gold cane or murio's trophy room these primo bars <laughs> right. like for example yeah. I remember walking in one day and it was really quiet and there's all these people sitting at the bar staring at the tv screen and it looked like it was a crazy like intense news event that was happening and everyone because the music stopped yeah. They were just looking at the TV. And I look up there to see what everyone was watching. And it was behind the music, ACDC. Oh. And everyone was just like, just shut up. Shut up, man. <laughs> this was our day, man. At this time, you, you were with him for a year and then you get into your own place. Mm -hmm. Do you start to see the neighborhood get gentrified? Do you start to see some shit happening? Absolutely. Yeah, you start seeing, because at the time, you know, me and my girlfriend, we find a different apartment, and now we're, we have to pay $1,000 right. for like a one-bedroom. Right, from 300 to to 1000 Exactly, within about a year and a half. Wow. Yeah, so... It happened that quick. Obviously, something was happening. And, and more and more indie stores started popping up, and it became... It was like the Wild West for indie businesses. There were so many businesses that just thrived at that time, like, even that video store did incredibly well, but record stores and vintage clothing stores, and it was, because it was so cheap. If you signed a lease in 2000, a 10-year lease. Oh, my God. You're going to be killing it. Oh, yeah, you're right. So, you know, I was lucky enough to be one of those small businesses that signed a lease for 10 years back then. Wow. With the dude. Oh, no, when the, in the new place, cross yeah, the street. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, down the street. But still, I, was, I signed a lease. It was 5000 bucks a month. Wow. And I signed a 10-year lease. 30 grand a month now. Whoa. Like if someone wanted to rent my space right now, it's 30 grand a month. 30 grand. Thir for <laughs> 5 grand a month to 30 grand. It's ridiculous. What was crazy too was that show Girls mm -hmm. starts shooting there and it really it, it was it was really wild to see like that was really what the fucking neighborhood was. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I mean, the one, I think the one episode that was popular was in a restaurant called C. Yeah. It's a Thai restaurant that's just a few doors down from my store, actually. Yeah. Still. And it's, it turned into a complete tourist trap after that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it put this fucking neighborhood way on the map, <laughs> man. It was crazy. I would talk to people and they're like, dude, I'm moving to Williamsburg, you know, from here. And I was like. <laughs> What the fuck? Is, like, I mean, look, Williamsburg is cool and everything, but if I'm moving to New York, I'm living in the goddamn city, you know, because Williamsburg became more money than Manhattan. Absolutely. I mean, I'd rather live in the Lower East Side or, or the village or whatever, and, it, you know, just for me, because then you step out on the street and you're there. The convenience of Williamsburg was worth every penny. Though. Oh, it was. Yeah, one stop. I dug that, but you know, then you, they, they kept saying they're going to shut down the L like two years ago. <laughs> yeah. That, that was amazing. And all of a sudden, rent started creeping down. I was like, this is your time to get in, man, right now. Why yeah. the L is going to be shut down? Then the L didn't shut down. It didn't. No. That guy. That I, and I was crossing my, when my, my store does so well yeah. when the subways get shut down. Yeah. If there is some kind of incident where you can't get from Williamsburg to Manhattan, I kill it. Because all these customers that actually don't know about me that are going to B and H Photo, oh yeah, or going all the, out around all the big box stores, yeah, they're like, I can't get into Manhattan. Where am I going to buy a hard drive? Yeah, and so it's like, just go to Mikey's, and that's how I, I get these new customers. So you've been booming there for how many years now? Nineteen years. Nineteen years after your tenure lease uh, was up, did you resign? Yeah, I resigned. Way more money. 
A little bit. Well, I had a really, I have a really nice landlord. Oh, that's great. He likes a consistent check rather than crossing his fingers that someone's going to pay. Right. Well, that was the old San Francisco thing mm-hmm. when the dumb dot com, the first wave in the '90s came in, and everything got shut down because the landlords were greedy. And then those businesses went away in a year, and they <laughs> right. lost people that they had for thirty years, like Mars Cycle mm. and and DNA Lounge right. and and uh, Torino, you know, all these places. Uh, here, Slims. Slims, yeah, uh. that's just cool. That's brutal. But they had a long fucking run, they man. Did. Yeah. Boss Gags had a long run at Slims. <laughs> he really did. Now. You're there, you and your lady, do you guys break up and you move to L.A. or what happens? No, here? no, so we break up um, five years into it in 2005. I got to, uh, to rent an apartment and it was now it's like 2,500 bucks. Yeah. And I'm like, you got to be shitting me. Like, I'm not going to pay 2,500 bucks a month. And I asked this agent that I was sitting and looking at apartments through this catalog. I'm like, what do you have for sale? As a joke. Yeah. And he's like, well, uh, and he starts showing me some apartments. And I'm flipping through a page and I see this one apartment. I'm like, that looks pretty cool. Can I check it out? Just to look at it. Right. So he takes me over there to Grand Street and I fall in love with it. I'm like, how does this work? I'm like, how do I buy this? Yeah. And he's like, well, you need, you need a 10%. And what, how much was it? It was like 500 grand they were asking for this apartment. Right. Good deal. Yeah. And I'm like, I've, I've saved. I've saved. I'm like, I could put down this 10%. That's like all I had right, was yeah. the, the down payment. Right. And he's like, well, let me call my mortgage guy and see what we can do. I get a call from his mortgage guy and he goes, listen, we're going to do this. What's called a no income verification loan. Is he's that, like, is it just bank statement one? Yes. Right. And, and he goes, just brought that back two months ago. Right. By this, the way. Is, this is in 2006. Right. Well, they got, they yeah. got rid of it after that because the Fannie Mae and exactly. everything hits. Yeah. So I was one of those guys where they were just giving candy away. Wow. And so within like, yeah, a day, he's like, yeah, you're approved. Wow. I'm like, really? That's why I, I don't have buckled. any credit. And now I'm going to own a $500,000 apartment. Yeah. And so. God, I wish I could do that <laughs> right now. And uh, believe me, in 2008, when shit hit the fan, I was scared. Yeah. But for some reason, Williamsburg did not get affected at it all. It did not, no. And, uh, so you put the money in and you get an apartment? So I get an apartment. Is it a one bedroom? What is it? It's a two bedroom, two bath. Uh, Holy shit, dude. Uh, what is it called? Um, on the top floor. Oh, yeah. With penthouse? A balcony penthouse apartment. Wow. Yeah. And dude, winner. Uh, yeah, it's totally stoked. And I had so many crazy parties there. Just ridiculous parties. And it just became the party house. Right. I mean, I'm single. Yeah. I got nothing better to do. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And I did really well with that apartment because. Oh, you end up selling it. So, yeah. Nine months ago. Yeah. When, uh, well, a year ago when I decided to open up a store in, in Silver Lake. What made you want to do this? So, for the past six years, I've actually been eyeing Silver Lake. Right. I, it has the same customer same demographic as williamsburg 100 percent. it's the same thing and, that's what i just said right and my the customers actually come to brooklyn actually come to silver lake all the time same customers yeah. not the same demographic the same people yeah well, yeah and so every year for like there was one week i would come to la and check it out try to see if i feel the vibe did you just want to get out of new york you were done no, I, I actually no i was still fine with it I'm right. totally happy with it and then a year ago we're driving, looking at uh, storefronts, and I didn't like any of them I saw, nothing. And I drive by Rockaway Records, and I see this for lease sign. And I call the for lease uh, sign, and the guy says, yeah, for rent, take a look at it, meet with the owner who owns Rockaway Records. Love Rockaway. And Love it. You know the bar Zebulon? No. It's uh, on Fletcher. Right. Um, really yeah, close to the Yeah, I know where Fletcher is, yeah. Okay. Incredible bar. They have incredible shows, too. Wow. You gotta look it up when they open back up, yeah. of course. So they used to be in Williamsburg. And I would always ask Jeff, the owner of Zebulon, I'm like, what should I be looking for if I open up a store? He's like, stay away from Sunset. You don't want to be in an area where it looks trendy. You yeah. need a parking lot. Yeah. And you need convenience. And you need to be close to highways. Yeah. 
And I'm like, what the hell does that mean? I'm from Williamsburg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? A subway and a two-block walk. Exactly. That's what I'm used to. But he's and, so right there. And I see the spot that has a huge parking lot. Yeah. That's close to every major highway. To all of them. And the price was right. Incredibly right. Compared to New York. Oh, yeah. And the, I signed the lease. Right. And I tell my wife, I'm like, let's just see how the store goes for like two years. And so I'll, you're going to stay in New I'm York. Gonna st- we're going to stay in New York. Hire people working in, New York, in L.A. Yeah. And I'm going to fly in every couple months, stay for like a few days, yeah. make sure everything is running smooth. And, and if it works out, well, maybe let's move to L.A. in a couple of years. And my wife pretty much just slapped me in the face. Was like, Are you crazy? You think the store is just going to take off by itself? Yeah. You think that's how it happened in Brooklyn? Yeah. It's like, no, you have to be there every day. Because you're Mikey of Mikey's hookup, and you have to be there. Yeah. There's no way you can just... And the New York store's already working. Well, the store's been there for 20 years. 20 years, yeah. yeah. They don't even know Mikey really exists. I yeah. hear it all the time. It's just a name. <laughs> right. Yeah. And... So, so yeah. she's giving you the green light of, get, let's get the fuck out of here. Exactly. And I look around, and I'm like, you know, I've been here for 20 years. I've done it. I've played this game. If this was a board game, I, I came to the end. Yeah, yeah. And if it was Candyland... And we put our apartment on the market. And Dude, you had to kill it with that apartment. It, we did really well with you the apartment. You had to kill we, it, we did really well. Two bedroom <laughs> in well, Williamsburg. It gets better because yeah. two years ago, the apartment next door, because there's two apartments on the top floor. Yeah. And the, my next door neighbor is like, Mikey, I'm moving to LA. He's like, I'm selling my place. And uh, he's like, if you're interested, let me know. I'm like, I'm interested. Because we just had a baby. Yeah. And I'm like, we need more room. So you can make it two, the whole upstairs. And so I figured we could just take down his door. And now we have this giant, that's all it is. We just knock down his door. Whoa. And that's it. We have this giant, now we have a four bedroom, four bath. Whoa. So the fuck, dude? We buy it from him. Yeah. And Mikey's hookup's doing good. <laughs> Holy shit, just that little fucking store in Brooklyn, Brooklyn. And so when we put it on the market, we put it on the market as you could either buy two, you know, two one apartments year, yeah. or you could buy both. Yeah. And this one buyer just flipped out. Because where else are you going to find a four bedroom, four bath? You're not going to find that anywhere in New York City right. unless you go up to Harlem. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So it sold really quick. And Dude. That had to be like five million bucks, man. Right? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, no, I know not that. Right, not right. five. Yeah, but, but it's yeah. fucking big. I know the market there, man. I studied it hard. And uh, we got out just in time because we sold it in uh, December. Right before COVID. Yeah. Holy shit, dude. Did you buy something here? So we bought something here. Where in, you at in, here? In Los Feliz. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, 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 my, that's my hood, man. Yeah, love it. It's the... It's Walk into Hillhurst. It's yeah, beautiful. all time, dude. All time's incredible. Yeah, Walk into best. little doms and just oh, sitting yeah. out front. Fucking great Love little dom. Back when we could do all this. Right. <laughs> then you go into Lassen's and get some fucking fresh fruit. Exactly. Pop into the Trader Joe's, Gelson's, or Albertson's. <laughs> go to Homestay for some tacos. It really has. The Vista yeah. for movies. Now, you got kids, so you're not going you're not going to movies, <laughs> but you know what I mean? But I hear they have a... A friend of mine was telling me they have like a, a once a year like, true romance showing at Vista. Dude, that theater is I love incredible. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, so it was, uh, we moved here. So how's the LA store going? The LA store, the first couple months, Yeah. I was a little worried, obviously. But right. we had a, such a following from Williamsburg coming in to the store. They were super excited. I'm like, okay. It's got potential. Right. Like obviously, we're like maybe 20% of what we do in Brooklyn, but it, it's the first couple months. What of course. You know? I'm not complaining. And then, I don't know if you know this, but we're an authorized Apple repair center. I saw the people coming in like that nonstop. So How do all, you get that? Do you sign so, up? <laughs> in 2004, I called Apple because I just wanted to carry their power adapters. Yeah. Because I love, I just wanted to carry every adapter. And the only way to carry Apple adapters is you have to be authorized. And so I called up Apple back in 2004, before any Apple store, before they even had Intel chips in their computers. Right. And I'm like, I want to carry your adapters. And they're like, okay, just as long as you sell 
$100,000 worth of product in one year, we'll continue your, your contract. Wow. I'm like, I'm not going to sell $100,000 worth of adapters. Yeah. But yeah. I just said yes anyway, just yeah. to just start selling it. Of course. It. And uh, they're like, by the way, if, because you're authorized, you could also sell our computers too. And I'm like, I'll give it a shot. Yeah. And so I started selling their computers. And in Williamsburg, everybody wanted an Apple computer. Of course. So now we're making a killing on selling Apple computers because we're the only place um, that's selling Pre- Apple computers. Pre-Apple store. Exactly. Right. And I have this one employee that loves to tinker. He's like, hey, what if we start fixing Apple computers as well? And so we become an authorized repair center. And so when you call up Apple, they just refer people to come to the hookup wow. to fix their computer. So, and you got that in L.A. too, huh? So now I'm grandfathered in. Now you can't get that. If you call up Apple, they're going to just deny you. They have Apple stores now. They don't need yeah. an indie Apple Repair Center. Right. So when I wanted to open up L.A., I asked them, can I open up an authorized place in L.A.? They're like, you do great in Brooklyn. Why not? Go for it. And Shit. so they gave me the authorization. And there's two other places. There's Melrose Mac. I know them, yep. And no parking, though. No parking. No parking. And there's Los Feliz High Tech, which... I've never been there. Yeah. Oh, I know where it is, next to the Chinese restaurant. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What am I talking well, about? Been, it used to yeah. be a record store. Oh, really? Yeah, it had bootlegs well, they've, been clo- they've been closed for a while, so I don't know if they're coming back or what's going on. But because of the shutdown, the Apple store is shut down. Yeah, they're shut down. And once they shut down, they had to refer people to go somewhere. And so next thing you know, we have a line of people down the block trying to drop off their computer or buy Apple supplies from Mikey's hookup in L.A. I couldn't believe it. I got in there. You're like, yeah, come around uh, three to four because it's slower. I'm all <laughs> slow. It's COVID. There's no way this guy has anybody in there. I got there at like 11.15 in the morning and there's like 20 people there. I was it's like, a- I mean, there's so many people that in L.A., obviously, that need their computer fixed. They're breaking their screen. They're spilling wine on their computers. Yeah. But uh, and they also need supplies. But, uh, you know, it's so now you're killing it. We're doing really well. I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen when all the Apple stores reopen, but we've gained a huge customer base from this that's, that's for sure. it's great because they're just gonna go there it's easier you go to the mac store you walk in the dude's got the pad hi uh, the <laughs> genius center's over there then you're sitting around for like 45 minutes then the guy comes over and he you sit there for 45 minutes and he goes yeah we're gonna have to keep this overnight or whatever right. and you're like what, the, what why am i sitting you know and and then it's just oh it's lo- there's too many people in there no it's it's a huge difference yeah obviously. Like Bill Burr, I got to send him to your shop because he goes to the Apple store and he has a goddamn meltdown. He would love your type of store because right. it's indie and you're going to look at him in the face and go, these are the cords you need. And if they don't work, just come back. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and just all the people that have, it seems like there's a recording studio every 20 feet. In Silver Lake. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And they all talk to each other. Yeah, they do. They come in going, hey, my, my bro that has this recording studio told me about you guys. Like, every day, there's someone coming yeah. in. Now, we're over here at the crib, and I haven't owned a TV in 10 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, because of COVID, I'm like, well, fuck, man. Uh, do I get a TV? You know, finally, I mean, I I didn't have a TV because I was doing comedy and I didn't give a fuck about TV. I'm out every night doing comedy. Right. And now there's no comedy. So I dive into the rabbit hole. I'm the type of guy that absolutely loves this type of shit. I like to find the best of the best and I like to find out why it's the best. And then I tell all my friends, this is what I know and knowledge you came in and you have projector knowledge, which is cool to talk about. What do you think is the benefits between a LED or an OLED flat screen compared to a projector? Well, there's no point of getting a projector if it's not going to be bigger than 70 inches. Right. I got gotcha. you. Just get a TV. Get gotcha. a TV. Right. If you have a space to get 10 feet wide, image on the wall you get a projector and you don't skimp on the projector you don't buy that 300 dollars amazon projector 
Yeah. You have to get, you know, a $2,000, $3,000 projector. Now, in the $2,000 projectors, do they make the short throw ones that are on the floor, you like can, two absolutely. feet away? You I want to explain to people, I didn't know this till last week. I'm thinking projector, you mount it on your back wall, you got that dumb fucking metal thing off your wall and it sits on there. And I saw one that just sat on the floor and you know, two feet away and blasted this primo image. You could totally get one of those, but the one thing you have to worry about is fan noise. Fan noise, yes, gotcha. Yes, the closer you are to a projector, because there's so much heat going on in the projector. Wow. There's a fan So you, if you're in. right here and it's there, you'll hear it. Yeah, unless you have the volume up and you're not going to hear it. Right, but, but during still. the quiet scenes, it's going to be annoying. That's why if you mount the projector far in the back, you're not going to hear it. So you really but, do need a big room for the projector. You do. And you don't have to mount it in the center anymore. Oh. You can mount it in any corner. Ooh. Because these projectors now have what's called a lens shift. You can shift the lens to center in the room. Oh, shit. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's insane. It's pretty amazing. Who yeah. makes the best projector? I love Epson. Okay. Epson, I think, makes the best home theater projectors. Wow. For sure. Now, what I'm digging into is OLED screens. Mm -hmm. LG makes all the OLED screens for the companies. Mm -hmm. But Sony, from what I'm reading, makes the ultimate processor for the LG uh, screen. So you want a Sony, everybody says. And it's not even that with it when it comes to Sony. Sony's been making TVs yeah. for so long, and they've always made the best TVs. They have. And... There's no reason to like skimp when you're if you want a really, really good, reliable TV. And if you just pick up and feel the weight of what Sony puts in their their flagship. I'm talking about their flagship TVs, not their like cheap. Yeah, the Bravios and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah the, the Master Series. man. The Master Series. Listen to this. So there's some editing studios here in, in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. High, high end ones. Yeah. And. Sony makes these just outrageous screens for them to edit on. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you know, $100,000. But what they wanted to do was offer a, a screen almost that quality for, say, $5,000 at, at 65 inch. And man, dude, I went and looked at them side by side with a bunch of stuff. Now the OLEDs have true black, yep. meaning you're going to get exactly what the director wanted you to see. And when they're showing it to you, they're showing a lot of superhero stuff, Batmans that are okay. in the dark, that kind of stuff that's really dark. Uh, and when you look at it next to an, an LED screen, it's the, uh, we were watching, um, What's the one where they're in the tiger, in, in the boat, that famous movie? Apocalypse Now? No, oh, no, you're talking about a Life of Pi. Life of Pi. Yeah. Side by side, three screens. The guy is uh, Indian. Right. On the far right one, which was supposed to be this primo screen, he was white. The next screen, he was kind of uh, suntan, and the OLED, he was brown-skinned Indian man. It was crazy, the difference. Also, on the other two, you could see the horrible makeup because okay. you could see the person's makeup. Well, that, that has a lot to do. When you get this TV, yeah. there's a very important thing you have to do. Oh, I know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, where you, you're doing the... Uh, what's the soap it? opera effect. Yeah, yeah, you turn that yeah, off. Yeah, turn it off. And they, they call it something different. Every manufacturer They do, and you got to yeah. find it. Yes, because yeah. if you don't, you lose your mind. I've... I've been into hotels, and I, all I want to do is watch a movie, and that soap opera effect is on, and you can't change it in a hotel. Yeah. You have no control over the settings. Yeah. And I want to scream. I want to scream so loud. Yeah. It's terrible. It's I call it the, I'm, I'm 56, I call it the Sybil Shepherd moonlighting effect. <laughs> right. Because if you watch the old TV show Moonlighting, mm -hmm. it was her and Bruce Willis. Right. Bruce was normal, and every time they went to her, she was all frosted. <laughs> and you're like, what is going on here, man? It's <laughs> like so weird, the effect. But that, no, that's definitely turned that off. But what's most, most important, you could get a you know, a million dollar TV. Yeah. It's what you're plugging into it. Right. 
as, as well. You mean uh, the TV, uh, like Netflix and all that? Or, well, or, yeah, I mean, you or know, the, sound or what? whatever streaming box that you're right. going to put oh, into yeah. it yeah. will make the world a difference. Well, well. these new OLEDs mm -hmm. and these new, uh, the Sony 950H, which is uh, LED, super LED, these are Netflix calibrated, which is <laughs> wild. What the hell does that mean? So they have the button right on here, Netflix, yeah. and it's calibrated to stream exactly how the films, the TV show is supposed to look, how they wanted the 4K, how they're there. You know, Netflix has a standard now. Like if you're shooting a comedy special or anything, you have to use these cameras and it's got to be in 4K or they will not take it. Netflix? Netflix, 100%. Wow. So they're, these, they're finally like yeah. trying to compete. Because so far, Apple has the best when it comes to quality. Right. Um, so are you talking about their TV, their Apple TV? Yeah, so like the Beastie Boys special that just came out? Well, the movies, because, you know, they stream in, let's say, HDR. No, for a long time, Netflix was on the back burner when it came to quality of video. Of course. They just wanted the most content. Who cares how yeah, so clean it was? So they squished it because, I mean, where the fuck are they storing all this content? I know, right. you know, like super clouds or, you know, computers in Wyoming and a warehouse. Where the fuck is this yeah. stuff coming but when from? It, when it, like, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to... Uh, advertise apple but when it comes to yeah. audio and it comes to video they actually produce the best streaming right um, well they are all of a sudden and i love apple i'm an apple I, when people go oh fuck you you're a slave to apple or i'm like i don't give a fuck what you said because before Apple, I was on a PC, and I'd have to have nine guys come over and show me how to work something. <laughs> right. Fuck all that IBM think pads and shit. But when it's time for Apple to upgrade iTunes, they need to get to the HD streaming of Amazon and... Um, oh, and for audio. Of audio, yeah. They are behind now. HD Amazon streaming will blow your fucking mind. I'll play it for you before you split. Hmm. We, now, Apple needs to have an upgraded service. Like, okay, we got regular iTunes for $7, and for $10, we got super HD streaming. The problem is the market is so small that we'll pay that extra dollar. Well, I don't know, you know, because fucking Jay-Z's format is booming it's uh, is it well i mean uh, it yeah it's not booming <laughs> but i'm saying the people that really like music uh, i got it right here title um they it's it's like the the music people are either on title or amazon hd it, the problem with title yeah and I, i'm a music nut yeah is it's all you, you're relying on your internet if oh, yeah. your internet is just shitty that day, oh, yeah. title's going to suck yeah. because it's pulling so much bandwidth. So if you're streaming on Apple Music, which is lossless, it's really nice. Yeah. It doesn't take up that much bandwidth. So if your internet's a little shoddy, you're, at least you're going to hear the fucking album. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's all about reliability. Like when it comes to the HD sound. Did you ever get into super audio CDs or DVD audio? Absolutely, yeah. I was I loved addicted. It. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking the Night at the Opera. Oh. Did you have oh, a yeah, yeah. Well, and the also, surround sound version of that was it, incredible. That shit was crazy. I also got into those master... Uh, oh, right. Their original master recordings. Yeah, I got yeah. into those. Uh, the, the vinyl version, but then they did the CDs, yeah, man. Yeah, the CDs, right. I just sold a GNR Lies one for 150 bucks. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> those things are so rare. Yeah. You know? But uh, I got... I, I mean, I get into... Like, but when audio. it came to super audio CD and DVD audio... Yeah. It only worked if you had the right equipment. Right, I know. And if you didn't have the right equipment, you couldn't Terrible. Hear it. it didn't and matter. It's actually very similar when it comes to high end audio, like yeah. HD audio. If you don't have the speakers and the I, stereo to well, really show. Well, that's what I tell it, everybody. I go, you look, I got, I got the speakers. Yeah. My whole point was I got 2,000 records. Mm -hmm. Okay? I got the turntable, I got the great speakers and everything. Oh, but I haven't been home for five years. So this shit don't mean nothing. <laughs> right. Then the, the, these speakers come out, DVLAs from France, 
And I get them over here. They let me check them out. And I said, if this sounds fantastic, I'll be able to sell my records. People are like, you sold your records? It's like, yeah, man, I, I love my records, but I'm never home. Now I'm home. And people are like, I bet you miss your records. I don't actually, because I, I did it. Mm -hmm. I did it. And you know what I don't miss? Fucking figuring out where to put them because the heat's over here or, or I don't have enough room here. Oh, I got to get another fucking thing for my key to hold them, you know. But I put these speakers on, and in a matter of three days, I go, I can sell all my vinyl. You it's, love you love those speakers that much. I'm gonna play them for you when you split. It's so. I know what speakers you're talking about because I yeah. saw them. Yeah. Now I haven't heard them. Actually, yeah. I only heard them once, and that was at an airport for right. some reason. In the airport, some restaurant had them. But I, I'm just saying this just because. I always look out for scams and fake marketing. Of course, and all that same stuff. here. Everything I've read or just looked at their specs, yeah, is complete bullshit. Yeah. Now they might sound amazing. They might sound really good. Right. But so far, what I've read about them, what they released, they said these are 500 watts. These are 800 watts. Yeah, 4,000 four, watts. Four, yeah, yeah 4,000 yeah, watts. Yeah. Do you realize how impossible that actually is? Well, everybody's all talked about that. But when you, when you look into how they're doing it, you know how they're doing it, right? It's not an analog watts. So you know when you had a 50-watt uh, tube amp, guitar yeah, amp. right. Then these digital amps came in, right. say a GQ, GK bass GK, amp. Exactly. And all of a sudden, it was, you know, 1,000 watts. Right. Digital watts... They can make, they, they don't heat up and they're, they're kind of like, you know, false wattage or whatever. You know what I'm saying? They, they are, they well, are. It's, it's actually at full volume with distortion, just complete sound. Right. Not clarity, just right. full on volume. So what they're yeah. doing with this is they're using the digital amp to give you the headroom uh, so you don't get the distortion and then they have the analog amp in there, which is smaller. So it's not like 4,000 watts. Like, you know, like I've read that, you know, a million people go, you, you, you don't have anything to drive 4,000 watts. I understand that. What I do understand more than anything is distortion. And mm. that's what I think my main fucking craze is all the time when I'm editing podcasts or music, and I hear distortion. I'll give people headphones. I go, you hear that? And they go, I don't hear it, dude. You're just crazy. I'm like, fuck, I wish I didn't hear this. It's nuts. It's like people that have perfect pitch, and they hear people singing. They can't enjoy it right. because it's distorted. I love distorted guitar, but I don't like distorted uh, music when you're playing it, and I don't like distorted talking voices. It makes me nuts. So... What I'm saying on this was it was so good that I think in five more years, it's going to be light years from this. Hmm. I think it's going to even get better and better because people are going to be living in smaller and smaller fucking places. So have you, and yeah. when you read reviews about speakers, yeah, what they don't do is compare them to anything else. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, Which I, is really annoying. Yeah. You, they review the actual speaker itself. Well, this is what I heard. But they've never actually compared them to this other speaker that might be cheaper, it might be more. Yeah. Compare the sounds. Yeah. Because it's actually kind of an annoying setup to actually put a switch box to actually A, B them. I, I, dude, it, I, you know, like I did with your gear here, I bought and everything. Yeah. I can't even tell you how, how three days straight of doing this non-stop headphones, different headphones, different microphones, microphone further away, microphone closer, microphone on a stand, shorter cable, longer cable. I did all that. I did that with the speakers. It's such a pain in the ass. So now you got a turntable and you've got a digital track and you've got a switcher and you're going exactly the same song back and forth, but you have to have somebody else press the button right. so you don't know in your mind. And after a couple days, I couldn't tell anymore. Right. Which was close enough for me. Because at first, I'd be like, this one's better. 
and it would it would go back and forth, which was great for me. If I if I was getting confused, it meant they were both pretty fucking good. And mm-hmm. I'm coming off a of Morantz two two seven five receiver, clip speakers, uh, an incredible turntable, a Riga, you know, uh, and and perfect mint vinyl. Yeah, you know. And you were going through what? And then you were going through these speakers? No, and then what? And then that was the clip setup, and then the digital with the speakers. Oh, and you compared it. And comparing them back and forth, and then also going from Tidal to Amazon <laughs> HD, back and forth. And, you know, at the end of the day, I was just doing it for fun. Uh, once I knew the speakers sounded pretty fucking good, I was like, well, I'm already good, because... If you're a guy like me who's been fucked and moving around for the last five years of apartments and shit, and, and also apartments is the key word here. Mm-hmm. I can't play anything. And, and also I'm older. I don't need tunes on 80. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. People are like, listen how loud this is. It's like, I don't care about loud. I care about clarity. Right. And I care about warmth and, and wow, this is amazing uh, air movement, you yeah. know, of like, whoa. And what I've learned over the years, how easy it is to just hit play. Uh, that d- dude. Is one okay. of the most important fucking things when it comes to playing music. Because you're going to listen to so much more music if yeah. you don't have to get out of eight remotes yeah. to get it working. Or get up there and flip the record every fucking <laughs> seven minutes. Well, I... My Brooklyn apartment yeah. had this ridiculous surround sound system that only I knew how to control. Right. Yeah. It had, I have, and I brought all this stuff to LA, but I only use two of the speakers out of the seven speakers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I went from a crazy surround sound system with full on BMW speakers. This giant center that's as big as this couch almost, just yeah. a center speaker. Whoa. This huge subwoofer and the two main speakers. And now I just have the just two speakers. 2.1? Just and no, a just sub? Not, no sub anymore. Whoa. Just two floor speakers. Uh-huh. And my Macintosh amp and my turntable. And but what air- about TV though? TV is in a separate room. Yeah. And it's just coming out of the TV. Just- just out of what TV you got? It's a Sony XBR. Does it have the speaker in the screen or is that new for this year? Now the speaker is the entire screen, dude. I, th- I think the speaker is in the screen because I see no speakers in the thing. Okay. And it sounds incredible. It fills up the entire room. Do you like sound bars? Hate them. Hate them? Hate them. Why is it? Well, any sound bar you get, you have to get a subwoofer. Oh, of course. No, yeah. you can't do it without the so sub. Once you tell someone that, they're like, oh, I don't want a fucking subwoofer. I don't know where I, to put a subwoofer. I know. You got to have a sub. There's, yeah, no, yeah. No, there's no fucking way. And it's, it's almost like Bose speakers. Yeah, yeah. They're known for real high pitch, like high treble, right. and low end. There's no mid anywhere. Right, right. And these sound bars have these tiny little tweeters, and then you have a low woofer, yeah. and there's no mid anywhere. Gotcha. You need that like four inch yeah. woofer somewhere. Yeah, it's tough. The, the, the video and audio stuff in life is so tough. I'm glad you came over today because it's constantly upgraded every fucking year. Yeah. Uh, you know, here comes the, uh, the, the show in Vegas, the CES, yeah. and all of a sudden, oh, that's a, it's funny because uh, my buddy uh, Jay sings in Rival Sons and I was commenting on a TV on an Instagram, and he said, doesn't matter what one you get, it's outdated six months from now, which right. is so true. And that's the world of uh, audio and video. That's how they stay in business. Yes, and so, no, it depends on like what you're going for. Right. Yeah. I think what you got to do is you got, for you, and this is what I always tell people, audio and video is a lot like art. Do you like it? If you like it, then that's fucking it, man. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because you'll get into these YouTube reviews. You'll get into these high-end website blogs. And then you'll get to the store and you get confused. Because I know I looked at the Sony OLED and they said straight up, it's a dark TV. So Mm -hmm. if you've got a bright room, it's going to suck. And right next to the Sony OLED... For half the price is their brand new 950 LED uh, 
LED screen. And I was like, God damn, that looks fucking good too. You know? So it's really what you like. Yeah. And I think both of them are going to be incredible. Yeah, they are. They <laughs> are, man. And, and like, you know, when it comes to projectors, what I tell friends that are looking for a projector. Yeah. And whatever you can afford, let's say it's a $500 projector. Let's say it's a $800, $3,000 projector. Whatever projector you get, just don't go over to your friend's house that has a better projector. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to be really bummed because your projector will blow your mind. Your yep. $500 projector is the best thing you've ever seen in your life. Just don't look at someone yeah. else's higher end one because then you're going to be like, all right, where's my credit card? Well, it's tough at Best Buy, man, for those guys, you know, because there you are. You see the OLED and you go, holy shit. And right next to it, they have the three that are supposed to be just right under it. Mm -hmm. And you're like, if you saw any of them on their own, you'd be like, that's incredible. But when you see it next to the OLED, you're like, oh, man. But a lot of these places, they're pumping this like outrageous content that you'll never see yeah. from yeah. your streaming device. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And also... They have the brightness setting way the fuck up. Yeah, they do. Well, the OLED, that's the problem. You can set it all the way to the brightest, and that's going to be it. Where the LED, you, it may be super bright, and you can bring it down. But mm. on OLED, you can't bring it up more because mm. it's not made like that because it's made to show the true blacks. So I mean, it all depends on the, the, the construction of it because my parents' TV from... 12 years ago. Yeah. This pioneer elite. Yeah. Still to this day, when I go over and look at that TV, I think it's better than my fucking Sony I bought two years ago. Wow. It's just, I don't know what it is, how they constructed it, Yeah. but it's a beautiful TV. Well, the last one I had 10 years ago was the 6x9 Sony HD with the tube, the big old back that weighed 700 pounds. <laughs> right. And that thing looked fucking great. And mm. gamers loved it. Oh, CRT. Oh, oh, it's a rear projection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You right. know, the, it's the last of the tube. Right. Last of the tube. Oh, it was a CRT. Yeah, CRT. Oh, shit. Yeah, HD 6x. Yeah. Yes, I remember. Yeah. I had a 32 inch Sony. Yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah. I had a, th a 36. So I weighed like 250 pounds. Dude, the movers come over yeah. and they and they go, no way. Straight up, <laughs> no way. <laughs> right. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what do you mean? I'm paying in another thing. <laughs> They'll grab the refrigerator and put it on their back, but then they go, no way. Yeah. That was a beautiful TV because they had a feature. Because I remember when I was a DVD nut. Yeah, same when here. Progressive Scan first came out. Yeah, got the Progressive Scan and switched it on. And then there was a setting on that TV. Yeah. To uh, do anamorphic. Yeah. For uh, Progressive Scan, and it made the clarity incredible. Like you could just. You could look. You could look at every little pimple on someone's face. It was insane how yeah. clear it was, man. And you know what? Zero problems. Yes, yeah, Zero. <laughs> Just ran for life. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm out of here. Uh, thank you for tuning in, everybody. Uh, Mikey's Hookup. Got an Instagram. I do. Mikey's Hookup LA or Mikey's Hookup for just the Brooklyn store. And I know I'll be in your uh, shop quite a bit. Uh, uh, it's my new shop now. That's all there is <laughs> to it. And, uh, and everybody... Go to the shop. You know, I, I know a lot of New York people listen to this podcast and a lot of L.A. people. And this is a kick-ass one-stop shop. What I like about it is the people know what the fuck they're talking about when I'm in there. I'm like, look, here's what I got. I, I'm, I'm, I got distorted vocal. I got shit headphones. And boom, came in there and we're rocking. Yeah, we're not trying to sell you on anything. We just want you to get out of the store happy. Yeah. Even if we don't sell you anything, as long as you... Get the right knowledge. That's all we care about. Yeah, like that box, the cloud box. I was like, right. ah, this is bullshit. I don't need this thing. It's fucking big money. <laughs> we were trying to tell you, you fucking need this thing. And then I get home and I, I record with it and then I record it without it. And I go, oh, I need this thing just for the output. <laughs> exactly. You know? All right. Thanks a lot for doing the show, all my right, man. Thank you. And uh, check out some old Dance Hall Crashers records. Yeah. They're all over iTunes. And uh, also go to a store, follow them on Instagram. And if you have any questions, just call down there at the shop. And if you got uh, need some Apple-repaired stuff, man, there it is. Thank you for tuning in. Keep the candles lit.